my connection's been terrible, guys. I'm, I'm pretty much guessing when you stop speaking. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. And Neil Almond. Wonderful to be here. So last week, we started our exploration of really, really important paper, in our opinion. So I think all well, it makes sense just gets right back in there. I mean, what people will be really interested to know is what have we learned since 1998? I mean, what really stood out in this section for you? So as we discussed before, I think the um, the attempt to take cognitive load theory and give it a stronger found, uh, a foundation in um, evolutionary psychology um, is something that really jumps out. Um, I think it's description of like these five um, aspects or five principles, I should say, uh, providing the cognitive architecture for cognitive load theory. I won't describe what they they are in detail, but in effect, they describe certain aspects of our cognitive arch- architecture that could have and seemingly need to have developed through um, the process of evolution and how they can interact to bring to bring about certain effects that we see. Um, they talk about this 4C ID um, or four component instructional design way of thinking about curriculum design um, as, as, as a, a way of thinking about how to um, yeah, create learning that aligns with um, the effects that we see in cognitive load theory. Um, I'd like to read more about that. There's some references to some, some books in there, including some by like, the original authors, as you would expect um that i need to check out and haven't done yet and then of course there's this dive into like new effects so effects that have been explored found over the past um 20 years um including things like um the transient information effect um and you know guidance fading effect which are uh fascinating in themselves i think earlier on the before we started recording you mentioned that you really liked the diagram but my note says is this diagram actually helpful and it might just be me not interpreting the diagram properly or missing the design elements what was it you thought was really good about it because i have no doubt that the the 4c id approach feels like what teaching might be like in my classroom or what i hope it might be like in my classroom but when I looked at the diagram, I didn't recognize me in it. Is that aimed at me? Because if you're talking about the diagram with the balls and the L's and that sort of thing, I did not find that in term. I could not. I was going to say, I didn't remember actually saying that I found it useful. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's, that's how I hope it's aimed at Neil. Because the diagram it, it was with the L's Neil. and the circles. <laughs> like, on as far as diagrams go, it is not the most friendly diagram. Far from it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's an irony to that, though, isn't there? That there is this diagram that's in the paper that's trying, presu- seemingly, to take advantage of the modality effect. It's trying to say, look, we can explain this in a certain way. I don't, yeah, I don't think it gets the point across particularly well, um, which is you know, somewhat ironic given their obvious uh, ability to get stuff across in one modality, their ability to explain things. Um, is excellent but no I wasn't made, able to make much at all of that uh, of, the, of that particular diagram well, then I apologize for misattributing that uh, that uh, sensation or that response to the diagram to you Neil um, but I think it's Sorry. worth keeping that in because I think that's an important bit yeah because it, it is you know um, it probably bears you know who, who might the intended audience be for for such a diagram um, but if it's teachers I'm not I'm not convinced I think it needs more work um i mean there were some things like i mean just in general though my takeaway from the from the 4c id stuff was the idea of recurrent habits being very interesting and it's almost that um you know if we're looking for a vocabulary about um, procedural fluency 
you know, it felt like recurring habits fed into that. Um, so almost like if you're looking for a, a way to describe that, um, but drawing on something like cognitive growth theory, that might be interesting. Um, but also phasing support and the reversed phase scaffold. I mean, I think at one point there were four citations to check out if you were interested in backward faded examples or you know they didn't call them backward faded examples but essentially they said that you had this um the opposite of the expertise reversal effect uh when you had you know when people didn't think about the examples enough you know they just did them moved on or something like that i mean I'm, I'm probably mushing lots of stuff together but essentially they said that the idea was that you take the support and you bring it down gradually which obviously, you know, there are one or two papers that suggest that might be a good thing, but they've actually collected together four from the last couple of years, or certainly the last couple of years before the paper was written. And it felt like a lot of the things that we talk about on the podcast were coming through in this 4C ID. I don't know, is, is that how you guys interpreted this bit? As, like Chris mentioned, there's a few books um, mentioned. I think the most recent one there is called 10 Steps to Complex to Complex Learning. Um, and that's Von Van Merenboer and Krishna. And that'd be a really interesting one, I think, to explore in a bit more depth um, later on, because as I say, it's this idea that it's been in you know, developed in parallel with cognitive load theory. And I can kind of having briefly after I was uh, accused of liking a diagram I quickly highlighted every check back over my notes to everything that I made regarding the diagram um, to see if I could make any kind of sense of it um, which I couldn't in the couple of seconds that um, I was given but I can kind of see how there is kind of a real kind of as to say for there's decided this learning task which has uh, supportive information. And as you said, this kind of part task practice where we kind of help develop um, pupils to develop these kind of recurrent, what they call recurrent. There's like problem solving, reasoning kind of activities and where we kind of also support when this development of this more kind of procedural fluency kind of stuff there. So again, whilst I was kind of reading that section, um, I appreciate it's a bit of a tandem. I was again, just thinking of that awful, uh, situation that I kind of found myself in for kind of two or three years of my teaching career when I tried to get children to go through sort of procedural flu fluency tasks through to uh you know reasoning and problem solving within you know probably 20 minutes of them actually having thought deeply about a particular small step and yeah just how that's not um, not effective practice if we're thinking about it in the sense that, okay, so we're learning this brand new idea. Um, we're going to teach you how to do it so you can do it fluently or, again, you can perform it. Um, I will use that as a proxy for learning and then I'll move you on to a reasoning and problem solving task to do with that particular small objective, um, which I think is not particularly effective practice. Um, and I kind of think from what this model kind of does say, does kind of provide some, not the most straightforward interpretation of why actually going through uh, a sequence of learning like that may not necessarily be the best thing for our learners because of the uh, amount of um, intrinsic load based on that. And because we're increasing the variability too quickly in terms of them having to be just fluent with it without it being in the context of, uh, a problem to it being in a context forward problem too quickly we do sort of uh you know we don't manage that cognitive load in such a way that actual uh, you know far transfer can happen when reading the bit on self-explanation what jumped out at me was that it felt like michael pershing really nailed the application of self-explanation in the classroom as all you know this is basically you know what michael's been saying particularly in his most recent book um, you know, obviously, Michael studies the, the the research thoroughly before committing anything to the written word, you know, so it's to be expected. But I, I thought that really stood out for me. I mean, there are some bits in this that are um, counterintuitive. And obviously, this stuff was counterintuitive when it was first brought out. So I'll be interested to see where this goes. But what about the imagination effect? What was your response to that? I immediately went to reading on that one. 
um, and thought about how when we come to think about comprehension, you know, children having to understand that, you know, you are having to build up for this kind of situational model. And by imagining, you know, there is research to suggest this idea of visualization is a useful um, uh, strategy to teach children um, when they're reading a text, this idea, you know, what sometimes you're going to have to stop and visualize what's just happened in the story and, you know, play out those moves bit by bit. Um, so I, you know, could really see a link between what's that's what the imagination effect is and how that would be something useful for comprehension but also in how because in the imagination effect they mentioned that you know a, a decent level of prerequisite knowledge is needed for the imagination effects to be effective which obviously makes sense if you can't um picture something um then you, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to imagine the concept whatever it is and so for me I found that quite an interesting one from that reading perspective, this idea of, yeah, okay, if they have enough prior knowledge about um, the text, um, so they can kind of generate this situational model. And um, there is research again to suggest that the better the background knowledge, the kind of better these situational models are. So therefore the better that they might be able to then imagine something that's happened in the text, perhaps they get a little bit lost or confused. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic, I think, to, to the imagination effect. I can kind of imagine once children have had a couple of experiences of creating bundles of 10 with something um, to kind of help create place value, I can never like, right guys, let's just imagine that we're going to, you know, bundle this up. What does it look like? Going back to, uh, is it Farmer Fred and his uh, sack of potatoes, Kieran? Yeah, so bringing the imagination effect into there. So yeah, I, 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 I can, I can see the theoretical underpinnings of it and I can certainly connect it to other bits that I know and so yeah I, I'm I'm a fan of the imagination effects and you know we can bring the fun back into primary and, you know it never not that it ever left us in the first place but you know here it is cognitive load is saying we can use our imaginations for learning so you know bring it on. See so I uh, grouped it with um, like the guidance fading effect and the self-explanation effect as just this this something that says okay I want you to put some effort in I need you to do something please for goodness sake be less passive do something because the re if we're looking at like the imagine what we're effectively saying with the imagination effect is us going you know what when you know a certain amount imagining it is better than me showing it you again you know imagining a particular concept or a procedure is better than me modeling it for you again that seems to be what the effect shows and the idea presumably here is that there is greater um, worthwhile intrinsic load. So, I mean, domain load is, I'm, I'm kind of wary of using the phrase now because it's more about the distribution of working memory resources within ex intrinsic load. I'm not exactly sure how that all works out semantically, but this idea that, um, I, I think there's some value in this idea that what the imagination effect is in effect doing is saying, I need you to I need to do something that will guarantee a little bit more cognitive effort on this person's part, you know, a little bit more of this um, germane load in the same way as the guidance fading does. You mentioned a moment ago about this idea of, you know, there's a worked example effect, you know, I'm going to show you something, how it works. And that's a good thing because it reduces cognitive load. But the great thing about, you know, guidance fading is that you kind of begin to get the best of both worlds where I'm sh I've shown you it. Now I'm showing you enough, but you've got to finish it off, you know, and the amount that you've got to finish off will increase over time. So I'm very gently increasing this intrinsic load. I'm very gently um, supporting you to, to, to kind of to learn this thing while taking, you know, account of your limited working memory. Same with kind of self-explanation, which feels like a more like general version of that. I mean, the imagination effect is seemingly this idea of saying as i say let's imagine a concept or a process self-explanation is kind of halfway there it's but it's it's like trying to imagine it's like the imagine imagination effect before you've fully learned something if that makes sense it's it seems to be okay we're nearly there why do you think this makes sense whereas the imagination effect is kind of a bit after the after the fact so i kind of group them together in this sense um i think I, th I think it needs a new name because when I hear imagination effect, I immediately go to, if you believe you can do it, then it'll become true. 
you know, and that's not what they mean. You know, maybe some sort of augmented internal reality effect <laughs> or processing effect <laughs> might be a, might be better for the the branding. You know, the PR team for the the imagination effect really need to get their finger out. I think. You imagine that they kind of thought about, well, is it the visualizing effect? But then they realized that, you know, you can't describe it as visualizing because then it's got to be something visual and they want it to also relate to things that are purely abstract. So I guess they're just left with imagination. But yeah, no, it works for me. And um, the only thing I was going to say, um, going through some of the kind of the new effects that they described since 1998 is actually... Um, Quite a few of them, I think people would be familiar with. Um, certainly, kind of, I think as to say, you know, Michael Pershing has done a fantastic job of, uh, you know, self-explanation. Uh, certainly, people, this, this guidance fading idea is, I think, quite well known, particularly with inside the mass community. And I think what's quite interesting is that the, um, so you know, it was Dan, Daniel Willingham that said, you know, learning only happens when you have to think hard. You can kind of see how self-explanation um, requires children to think hard so that's why that would work uh, imagination you know you have to think hard to imagine it so that's why that probably works uh, guidance fading you know you're thinking a lot more about the problem as you're more of that gets guided out and that's why that works so I think it's yeah interesting to kind of again you know connection alert uh, almost like, you know, like I need a buzzer every time that I've made a connection um, to this paper to you know reading other things and as I think yeah it's a great example of demonstrating how um, you know, that's one way that you can, uh, you know, bring into the classroom what Daniel Willingham says when he says that, you know, learning only happens when people have to think hard about it. Can I ask a quick question? One of these effects, like the collective working memory effect, I haven't explored the papers around it, but I'm interested to find out whether the research that finds this collective working memory effect is school based or if it's the classic university psychology students because one of the things it go it talks about heavily is um like transaction costs and them not ne needing to not be too high in order for the collective working memory effects to, to come into play and i immediately started thinking about the transaction costs of getting groups of six kids to try and learn something brand like new together um which is you know they're pretty high <laughs> generally I mean, it's it's one of those classic misinterpretation points, isn't it? Where it's seen as the uh, the manifesto for group work, when actually it's 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 very heavily caveated, you know, in terms of there need to be transactions from all members of the group for this to be successful, you know, and like and like you said, the reason why group work often falls short of the mark is because you will typically find that it's very, very difficult to do in reality. Um, I think Neil appears to be having a look at the papers to see where they're from, but I personally haven't gone that far. I know that, that Paul Kirshner wrote about this and, and studied this, um, but the actual circumstances, I don't know. But I do know that it's one that has been hotly debated, and it's actually on my notes, you know, HMMMM, so like, hmm, collective working memory effect because i think the circumstances in which you need to get that effect to for that to manifest the opportunity cost might be quite great you know happy to be proven wrong but i think there are certain circumstances where collective working is something that is manageable but it's not very often in my experience yeah i was about to say i mean it's it's it getting kids to work in groups larger than pairs is quite a challenging thing to do and i definitely think there's a role for it in primary schools and almost certainly in secondary schools in all sorts of situations but it wouldn't be the first thing i turn to if i were looking at getting pupils to understand something really new and complex and that's kind of often what you know this research is is looking at it's not saying it's not you know looking into how do we deepen our understanding or explore it how, find ways to enjoy you know what we have already understood and uh, you know look at subjective elements it is very much saying how do we learn new stuff and under what circumstances might you know people working together be beneficial so be really interested to unpick that you know and if it turns out that it does push heavily back against certain biases that i have then good it's always 
uh, it's always nice to be challenged. There was one interesting bit in the paper, and I can't find it now, and it's really annoying me. There's a bit where it says, like, working memory, like, after you've used a little bit of it and it's depleted, like, giving a rest, then, like, repletes it. So I was like, maybe Brain Gym was onto something. <laughs> It's like, it's not the fact that you're doing those stupid things. It is just the fact that you're just basically giving them like a two, three minute break during learning. That quite could be an interesting thing to uh, to bring up if, if we wanted to uh, wanted to explore that bit a little bit more. Well, I mean, speaking about biases, like the idea of, well, one of my biases that I have, I have no basis for in evidence or anything along those lines is the idea that you do need to break up learning. You know, these afternoons where kids are, you know, you've got seven-year-olds learning for two and, a, two and a half hours straight or two hours, 15 minutes straight. Bizarre to me. It's just such a bizarre idea that we would just try that with children when we know that adults can't do that effectively. Um, so, yeah, if if some suggestions that, um, that working memory can um, suffer some level of depletion when it, in in relation to particular you know cognitive challenges that feels like a inherently sensible um understandable idea to me at least yeah i think that gets spoken about mostly at the end in the future section where it, and it's under resource depletion what i'd really like is how much rest is necessary you know yeah, so that, the, the, you know having a, having a figure on it you know because i'm thinking about there are times when I've read Williams' work and I've thought it's okay to do 15 minutes on something, you know, I'm talking about self-study, 15 minutes on something, switch the activity, and that's enough of a rest. If the difference is great enough, then and then keep repeating that cycle. So you can almost get an hour of four different activities or four different types of study tasks. And then that keeps you fresh. But is it as like Matt will say, have a physical break? at the end of every lesson so that, i mean he's trying to avoid lesson bleed so that his curriculum gets taught in the way he intended it to be taught but also you know doing the daily mile after your afternoon first afternoon lesson makes a whole lot of sense in terms of most afternoons i'm falling asleep by two o'clock you know so imagine what the pupils are feeling like and um, so and from a personal point of view i've always found 40 minutes to be a much more impactful maths lesson than 60. And then, like you, you've done in the past, and you come back and do that twenty minutes later on the day. You yeah. Know? So that's that's one I'm really interested in. And we may have almost moved into um, what the future might hold, because that was the one that that's the only known I've got down. So resource depletion. If we knew more about that, then we could shape our school day in a much more productive way. And it might even, in terms of curricular design, reduce the amount that we want to cover in, in an academic year. But actually, there's a better chance that people are going to retain this and then use that knowledge to make, you know, more robust schemas as they, as they move forward. Um, I mean, were there any of the future applications that stood out to you guys? Yeah, I think really briefly, I'd like to build on what you say there, uh, because I think arguably the, the boldest suggestion, and it is only a suggestion in the section related to future directions, is the possibility of explaining the spacing effect through this idea of working memory resource depletion because obviously the spacing effect really something been you know robustly found in various studies etc and the possibility that they suggest that it might be explained through this idea idea of the depletion of working memory resources is um yeah it's it's a fascinating one um I'd be very surprised, just again, biases here, I'd be very surprised if it ends up being fully explained by that. But if it is, then it certainly has implications for, um, like, as you say, curriculum design, as well as lesson design more generally. Yeah, well, I mean, Ebbing House did his work in the middle of the 19th century. We're still waiting on the optimum time for spacing <laughs> <laughs> retrieval practice. So, uh... <laughs> We could be waiting quite a while for an oh, actual oh, figure. Yeah, oh yeah, that'll never come about because it'll be, you know, thinking about element interactivity, you know, it, it might end up, it's almost certainly the case that the correct spacing is specific to the individual and the task, et cetera. So no, that, 
the day, as I'm sure you know, will never come where people are like, oh, yeah, no, you've got to leave exactly two weeks between this and this for this age of learners. Um, it'd, be, it'd be great if we could gather data on that level, but I don't see it ever really, <laughs> ever really happening. I think what's most important is that I sounded smart for about 30 seconds there before we, <laughs> we, the whole thing came tumbling down. So th- that's the bit I'll leave in. 30 seconds more than I ever achieved, so fair play. That's not true. Um, going back to your question, Chris, it was 83 Dutch high school students with an average age of 15 and a half years old. Nice. So not like that. Oh, yeah, here's like some PhD graduates coming together to work on a problem and the combined resources of the PhD graduates were surprisingly really effective. But yeah, it's no wonder that doesn't work when it's uh, it's not that, which is always quite nice. I guess the other bit is, uh, or the other future direction that looks particularly interesting, they talk about the idea of the possibility of self-regulated learning and whether ideas around self-regulation can be taught, the biologically secondary ideas they're keen to, to make clear. And they talk about emotion, stress and uncertainty and the potential impact of that on um, working memory and you know providing a framework that looks at um, how we might support pupils with that stuff via, you know, an understanding of working memory. But probably the most interesting bit as well is, again, it's future direction, so it's necessarily speculative, but it talks about uh, human movement and it links to the idea of embodied cognition and it suggests that potentially we might see um, physical gesture, physical movements as an additional modality alongside um, the visuospatial sketch pad and the auditory loop, in other words, are what we see and what we hear. So this third modality, as um, you know, you've explained to me in the past, Kieran, it does seem to be the case that the research that exists currently relates very specifically to the learning of things that have human movement involved with them, but they are willing uh, in the future directions of this paper to speculate a little further. I think at the suggestion that perhaps um, gesture may play a, a greater role in allowing pupils to tackle more cognitively difficult work. In other words, expanding working memory so that we can, if for a given moment, so I say expanding, taking advantage of another aspect of working memory would be a better way of putting it so that we can increase intrinsic load or increase the germane aspect of intrinsic load and speed up learning um yeah i don't think there's a great deal of research to back that up at the moment hence why it's in the you know future directions for research stuff but fascinating nonetheless yeah i think um is it dylan william who also always goes on about how he doesn't feel that like neuroscience is kind of tells us what to do in the classroom uh, I think on a weekly basis, not weekly, but I think on a certainly a yearly basis, I think I see him kind of tweet that. And what was quite interesting about this human movement effect um, is this kind of um, Van Gogh et al. in kind of 2009 suggested that this idea of like the human movement effect and like therefore the embodied cognition stuff, um, that kind of might work. Um, because neuroscience research has kind of suggested that it's the same cortical circuits that are involved in executing an action oneself also automatically responds to observing someone else executing that same action. And so should that be true, then I think we can finally go to uh, Dylan William and say, well, here's that kind of first bit of neuroscience uh, research there that might suggest that you should do this and obviously within the context of bearing in mind that it was also Dylan William who in 2017-18 said that cognitive load theory is the most important thing that uh, you know teachers should know um, yeah it'll be an interesting one to uh, come back to him on that one so it'll be really interesting to see whether that um, does uh, you know come to pass and that you know that is the reason why it would be really quite interesting um i think the uh, kind of interesting thing here about um kind of looking to the future is that obviously this paper was released in like 2019 2018 um and we're now um, as recording like 2023 so it might be the case that you know some of these things uh, have been looked at so a definite job for me after this is to go on to my uh my favorite uh 
research site right now lit maps and put this paper in and have a look at any other papers that have kind of uh, referenced this directly um to kind of have a look and see what other people are researching on and you know if whether they've you know built more on the these future directions which would be a really interesting uh, thing to see i mean it's funny you should mention neuroscience because i was listening to radio six which is obviously where i get all my scientific information from but they had someone on doing this section about uh, the power of narrative and they'd done some tests on rats and when rats are remembering where to go in a maze and whatever certain parts of the brain light up and they noticed that these same bits were lighting up in order as they slept so trying to suggest that they were remembering this in a story based form and they suggested that, that this happens on some level with humans as well but obviously there's a lot more going on when you scan a human brain i think um, and certainly there are a lot more interactions in a day perhaps um, but uh, yeah, there, there was almost like a, there, you know, how much we could actually take from this. Like I said, it's on Radio Six, but I thought it was really interesting that you know we've been talking about how important story is, and it's it's, it's that same kind of uh, maybe there is something that can tell us, but maybe it's just the things that we agree with. We will be prepared to use neuroscience to uh, to support us because obviously there are many instances where neuroscience has been misused um, in the name of uh, teaching. Well, and wasted a lot of a lot of time. I think the last thing to mention is the section on measuring cognitive load. I mean, I wrote down a question: Is this for teachers, or is this part of the academic discourse that has seen things like germane load develop over the last twenty years? Because I think how we measure cognitive load, the role and the presence of germane load have been two of the things that have been really picked apart over time. But I also think it's the part of the paper where most people will find you know, the least, not the least engaging, but the least accessible part of it. So my recommendation would be to skip that bit on a first read. What do you guys think? My um, simplistic answer is that teachers don't need to worry about it. I think that, and I think this is where we can draw into that why I don't think AI is going to replace uh, teachers anytime soon. I think teachers probably do, once, particularly primary school teachers, um, once you get to know a class particularly well, so after maybe you know three or four weeks, um, I think there are kind of tells that the children can give when you can kind of really get some sense that perhaps the cognitive load of a particular task is perhaps too much for them. And it's that kind of, in that sense, that measure of cognitive load is just a kind of a best bet based on, you know, that human to human interaction that you have, um, you know, with that class and the relationships that you have with that class to be able to work out whether um, you know, such things, uh, whether this cognitive, you know, their cognitive load of a particular task at a particular moment um, for a particular time is, you know, too high. So I understand the theoretical nature of why it's an important thing to do if we want to say, you know, empirically that, you know, this is a thing, you know, it's called cognitive load theory for a reason. Um, and the reason it kind of may, may remains in that kind of box is because the measurement of what load is, um, is a problem. I know that they refer to uh, they used to do some like self-reporting onto load and obviously all the difficulties that come with that and issues um, that do teachers need to know. I I honestly I don't think so. I think this is where you know teachers you know, shine really, and it is like the bread and butter of teachers. It is you know fundamentally that responsive teaching aspect. You know well, how do you know when to respond? Um, I think the reasons you have to do that are probably because the cognitive load of that task is is not right for that those particular groups of children. So I think it's something that teachers do um, you know, well already. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it that bit of the paper is very much technically how are we going to advance cognitive load theory research? That's what that is looking into and is most interested in. Um, but, but thinking about what you said there, Neil, there is a sense here in which well, there's a reason why cognitive load theory is quite um, popular. And it isn't just that it aligns with certain people's ideas about 
the direction of travel that makes sense in education. It's also the fact that parts of it are really quite intuitive. You don't need, cog- you know, no teacher really needs cognitive load theory to, to appreciate the idea that sometimes kids don't get stuff because it's too much for them at that moment. And perhaps you need to break it down a little bit. That's it's it's something that, you know, perhaps we need sometimes need a nudge in the direction. And I'm as guilty of that as any, as anyone. But it's an idea that teachers come to on their own. And the idea of I don't think this paper should or this part of the paper at all should be seen as trying to kind of suggest to teachers how they might recognize cognitive overload in their own pupils is i think it's purely technical purely technical stuff for those who are interested in um, where the research might go if there's anyone listening and they're still not convinced that this is worth a read i thought we'd pick out our three favorite lines from the paper now mine relates to the section on generic cognitive skills and it says as a response to those who suggest that this is where our attention should be focused It says such campaigns tend to fail, not because the skills are unimportant, but because they are of such importance to humans that we have evolved to acquire them automatically without instruction. And I'm like, there's so much going on there. It it literally takes years of argument, years of discourse, and provides a more than sufficient response in fewer than 60 words. And I think, yeah. You know, in terms of flags being planted throughout this paper, which you would expect because those flags have been planted throughout the author's careers, that really stood out to me. If you'll forgive me from doing so, I'm going to kind of shove two quotes together because I think they're really applicable to my favourite subject, which is reading. So one quote is, there is little evidence from far transfer studies that generic cognitive skills which transcend domain specific skills can be taught, which for those of you who are interested in, you know, the idea of comprehension skills, you know, you might read something into that. But what I like is there's a follow up quote, um, pointing out to students that a generic cognitive skill should be used on a particular class of specific problems can be effective, which is like, I don't think they're talking about comprehension skills and then comprehension strategies and the fact that it's worthwhile teaching them and why it's worthwhile teaching them. But the extent to which it aligns with these ideas is is fascinating because when we're talking about comprehension no we are it is really largely based upon um or the you know the idea of inference or whatever is largely based upon what we might think of as a generic cognitive skill that can't directly be taught but there's still value in pointing out certain things that bring children's attention to bear in a certain way so saying look this is a good t- this might be a good time to summarize this thing is not the same as teaching the generic skill of summarizing. It's drawing their attention to something and recognizing when to use this thing just quite natural. So those two together um, just spoke to me about reading. So I was, yeah, big fan of those. So mine also kind of comes from the uh, the Geary biological primary secondary stuff um, regarding um, teaching these generic cognitive skills and it, it, the quote is should a substantial body of such data become available further modifications to cognitive load theory would be required i just think for me um kind of chris mentioned it as well earlier you know cognitive load theory kind of you know people like it because it might subscribe to that sort of idea of you know quote unquote trad style teaching um and I just think this really kind of just shows that it's not about those kinds of dichotomies, dichotomies. It is literally just saying, you know, as far as the researchers are concerned, this is the evidence that we have and this is the direction that we are going in. However, if anything does come about to radically change anything, we ourselves are open to changing our mind and modifying bits of this based on any data that we get. And I think that's a powerful position for any sort of teacher researcher you know anyone to to be in you know don't be a, a slave to dogma and ideology follow follow these kind of good bets and be prepared to change those bets when new evidence uh, comes to light wonderful stuff yeah not not enthusiastically really because that was a 
really, really you know, stood out to me whenever I read it as well. I mean, I could spend another couple of hours talking about this. I mean, I think, you know, as usual, we've only really scratched the surface. But in the interests of drawing a line under this sort of first exploration of one paper in depth over a couple of episodes, I think all I have to do is say thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. And everyone at home, if you've enjoyed this format, let me know in the comments, you know, in Spotify, Apple, you know, probably leave a review. But until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.